I am a writer. That's what I do. I've been a full-time freelance writer for my entire adult life. I've written uh, scores and scores of magazine articles, dozens of books, countless blogs, probably two or three million words in my career. And yet I've often struggled to define exactly what it is I do. What does it mean to be a writer? What's my job? I put a lot of thought into this, and I've come to this conclusion. My job is to be curious. My job essentially is to question everything. My job is to ask why or how, to tilt my head at the world and maybe notice something that others have missed and ask myself, how can I explore that further? So question everything, that's basically my job. That's what I do. That being the case, I thought it might be interesting today to uh, flip the camera a little bit and question some of the so-called rules of writing. Uh, rules, really advice about writing that has almost become cliche over the years. I'm not talking about um, grammatical rules. Every author has their own version of those. Um, F. Scott Fitzgerald railed against the overuse of exclamation points. He said that's like laughing at your own joke. <laughs> um, Kurt Vonnegut hated semicolons. He said all that does is show that you've been to college. <laughs> uh, Stephen King said the road to hell is paved with adverbs. Um, but I'm not talking about those micro rules. I'm talking about macro rules, big picture rules about the writing process. And I would like to question some of those today. Uh, let's do the first one. Stay in your lane. I've heard this a lot and it frustrates me because it's basically a, a market focused view of writing choices. And I've heard it a lot from a particular faction of the book industry. I won't tell you exactly who they are, but it rhymes with literary schmagents. Um, <laughs> And um, I can understand what they're thinking, that uh, a jack of all trades is a master of none, that uh, an, uh, an editor or an agent or a uh, or reader should be able to categorize you as a writer, that success in one arena theoretically leads to more success in that arena. And of course, many authors are inseparable from their genres, Stephen King, John Grisham, uh, J.K. Rowling. But, um, Stephen King and John Grisham also wrote books about their first love, which is baseball. And J.K. Rowling wrote a novel about social issues. They wrote what they wanted to write. Now, they're gazillionaires. They have options. But um, why can't any writer have the satisfaction of courageous experimentation? How do you know where your talents are best suited or where your passions lie unless you dabble a bit? And I've pretty much been dabbling my whole career. I've been, I started out as a newspaper sports writer. And then I started writing for magazines. And then I started writing books, lots of children's books, sports books, travel memoirs, fiction, nonfiction, creative nonfiction. Lately, I've been dabbling in screenplays. And even then, my subject matter has ranged from uh, sci-fi action flicks to sappy Hallmark Christmas movies. Yes. Um, I, uh, I've given myself the luxury and the challenge of writing what I want to write about. Would I be more commercially successful if I had branded myself more? Maybe. Would I be as creatively satisfied? I don't think so. Writers are basically peddlers of notions. We send ideas out into the world. Uh, and there's no limit to the spectrum of ideas out there. So why limit yourself as a writer? Why limit your scope? You may see yourself as a square peg of a writer. I am a poet, I'm an essayist, I'm a travel writer, romance writer, a mystery writer, academic writer, but writers are shapeshifters. My favorite line from the poet Walt Whitman is when he said, I am large, I contain multitudes. To me, that's a great definition of a writer. So why peg yourself at all? So stay in your lane, I don't know, it's a 50 lane highway, let's see where it takes you. Um, okay, the next uh, notion that I would like to address is this, it's related to the first one, kind of, but it's write what you know. This one I understand too. Knowledge about a subject matter breeds confidence, and confidence is absolutely the most important attribute that a writer can have. A confident writer uses a stronger voice, takes more chances, uh, generally writes, crafts a more compelling story. But my favorite quote about this idea is from another poet named Howard Nemirov, and he said this, write what you know, that way you'll have a lot of free time. Um, so, in other words, there's a, way more that we don't know. And um, I love to write what I don't know. I like to write what I would like to know. 
My favorite thing about my job is that every project that I tackle is an intense mini education for me about something I didn't really know about. And when I'm learning something new and then I'm conveying new information, I tend to use a fresher, more dynamic voice. There's less chance of it becoming a little bit stale. So I love to write what I would like to know about. And often that consists of just wondering about things. Um, I might wonder, for example, uh, what was it like to write for Sesame Street? I, I grew up on that show. What's it like to write for that show? So I, I wondered, so I pursued it. I went to the set of Sesame Street. I met some writers. More importantly, I got to meet Oscar the Grouch. <laughs> that was like a bucket list thing for me, my spiritual hero. Um, and, uh, but I, I was curious, so I wrote about it. Um, another time I was wandering the grocery aisles, I was in the, was in the uh, baby food aisle, and by the way, one of those babies is now a first-year student at this university. Um, but I was in the baby food aisles, and I wondered, um, who is the Gerber baby? That adorable drawing has been on the jar since 1928. That's somebody. Who is it? And there have been rumors over the years that it was uh, Humphrey Bogart, or Catherine Hepburn, or Bob Dole. Uh, it's actually a woman who I found named Ann Turner Cook who is still around, she's 95 years old, she lives in Florida, but she'll always be the Gerber baby. I was curious about that, so I pursued it. Um, a, more, a broader example of that curiosity turning into a project is that uh, my, uh, my favorite illustrator and a friend of mine named Zach Pullen, he and I had, were curious. We wondered, who are some of the greatest thinkers in human history? Scientists, inventors, innovators. We had a lot of fun coming up with a very diverse list of about 70 people. And uh, everyone from uh, Aristotle and Galileo to Thomas Edison and Temple Grandin and, and everybody in between. Uh, and Zach created this amazing, beautiful, huge painting with all 70 or so of them together in one room. Uh, and then we turned it into a beautiful coffee table book in which I wrote a profile of each one of those thinkers. I mean, everybody, Jane Goodall and Isaac Newton and Walt Disney and the Wright brothers, everybody. You can imagine how much I learned while pursuing that project. 95% of what ended up being in the book, I didn't know when I started. So I love that education. It's probably why um, at, the, at the peak of the phenomenon, I wound up being on a show called Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? This was 20 years ago when there were about 30 million people watching that show every time it was on TV. It was a big deal. It was a really supremely bizarre experience. Um, and you know, I, I think I was on that show because, I think I got on that show because I know a lot of trivia because I've learned a lot. And um, I didn't win a million dollars. I don't want to talk about it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I did, I do want to say this. I, there, I, I was asked about a dozen questions when I was on that show. And um, out of any possible question ever, right, one of them was about a subject that I had written about 18 months earlier. I was asked a question about uh, well, I wrote a magazine article 18 months earlier about the two men who co-wrote the song Puff the Magic Dragon. One of my questions on that show was about that song, Puff the Magic Dragon. Um, so write what you don't know, and you never know where it will take you. Writing is about discovery, not only for the reader, but also for the writer. Uh, okay, what other writing cliche wants to experience the wrath of Brad? Okay, force yourself to write. Um, the thinking here is that... Is that uh, Maybe you force yourself to write 500 to 1,000 words a day, or if you're a full-time writer, write from 8 to noon and then 3 to 6 in the afternoon. Sit down, make yourself write. I understand the need for discipline, which is a very important part of writing, obviously, especially if you have a book deadline or a paper due the next day. Obviously, discipline is important. But um, I, it, it works for a lot of people. It doesn't always work for me. Uh, for one thing, when I force the writing, um, the force is not with me. <laughs> that I, I, it's, there's, it's a great way to get writer's block is to force it too much. I'm often asked if I get that dreaded affliction. And uh, my answer is generally no. I really don't because I, discipline is very important, but I'm all about mood and motivation and inspiration. What a lot of people don't realize is that most of the writing happens before the first word ever hits the page. I'm writing while I'm walking my dog, while I'm watching TV, while I'm listening to music, while I'm driving, while I'm talking with friends. For some reason, I, get, uh, I do some of my best writing in a particular place. This might be a little bit too much information, but um, I wrote half of this talk while I was standing in the shower. Um, I apologize for that visual. I don't have a slide for that. Um, 
But, um, but I, I do some of my best work there. And I can't tell you how many times I've uh, um, turned off the water, toweled off quickly, gotten dressed quickly, run downstairs and told my wife, please don't talk to me. I have to go write something down. It ha it's happened hundreds of times in my life. Um, so I try to let inspiration come to me rather than forcing it too much. And uh, I say, don't make yourself right. Just let yourself right. Be open to inspiration amid the mundane of your daily life. Everything that you encounter in your daily, encounter in your daily experiences is fodder for a story, is fodder for inspiration. You just have to let it come to you. Uh, all right, the next uh, writing cliche that I'd like to swat down is, is this one. Keep your distance. The thinking is, don't inject yourself into the story. Into the story. It's about the subject matter, it's not about you. Um, that makes sense for certain kinds of writing, especially a lot of academic writing. But I firmly believe that nothing you ever write is completely removed from who you are. Nothing ever. Nothing anyone has ever written, I believe, is removed from who they were. Who you are determines the subject, the angle, the tone, the perspective, the voice, the, the, the word choice. Who you are determines everything. So I say don't remove yourself, just use your perspective to enhance the story somehow. Sometimes a little bit of you is exactly what a story needs. Sometimes in a little way, sometimes in a big way. I'll give you a quirky example of that. Um, I once found out uh, a piece of information that I thought would make a really fun uh, magazine article. I found out that there are actually professional miniature golfers. It's not their full-time job, but it's, they go to different tournaments around the country and they can win like three or $5,000 for winning a mini golf tournament. I thought that's kind of funny. That'll make a nice fun magazine article. And I pitched it to, I used to write for a lot of airline magazines, the in-flight magazines, which is great. It's a captive audience. Um, <laughs> and um, and they, they liked the idea for the story, but I didn't think it was quite enough. And then I thought, and then I found out that there's an event that takes place every year in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. It's called the Masters of Miniature Golf. It's the national championship of miniature golf. The greatest mini golfers from all, all over the world converge and try to win this national title. And I thought, okay, that's a good way to frame the story. I still thought it needed something more though. And then I thought, okay, how about this? What if I compete in the tournament? <laughs> what if I try to win this the, the Masters of Miniature Golf? Uh, and I convinced the uh, magazine to send me to South Carolina. I convinced the tournament directors to let me into the tournament, which wasn't that difficult. Um, and uh, there were 31 people in the tournament. 28 of them were basically professional miniature golfers, really good. Two of them were a couple of grandparents on vacation in Myrtle Beach who <laughs> entered the tournament. <laughs> and one was myself. And believe it or not, I got a hole in one on my first two holes, and I started thinking, I'm gonna win this thing. <laughs> Forget the story, I'm gonna win this thing. Uh, well, unfortunately, we had to play 72 holes. <laughs> And after 72 holes out of the 31 golfers, I finished 31st. <laughs> I finished in last place. The grandparents beat me. Um, they were sneaky good. Uh, now, it was embarrassing, but it was one of my favorite stories that I've ever written. About, it was about how I finished in last place in the Masters. Uh, one rule about writing that I really do believe in is show, don't tell. Instead of telling the reader how intense this competition actually is, how good these golfers actually are, I showed them in a funny way by showing how bad I was compared to them. It was a much better way to tell the story. So I didn't have to um, inject myself into the story, but I do believe that it made it a better story because I did. So it's not really about removing yourself from what you write, it's just determ determining how much of yourself you want to put into your writing. Uh, okay, um, the very last um, cliched advice that I'd like to address is this. Start at the beginning. See what I did there? I left it for the end. Um, there have been a lot of studies done about convergent versus divergent thinking. Convergent thinking is basically you uh, use a pencil to fill out a scantron, you're trying to find the best or the right answer. It's like taking an SAT test. Divergent thinking is open-ended. Someone hands you a pencil and says, what can one do with a pencil? It's about creativity. Writing, of course, is open-ended. It's divergent thinking. Uh, but uh, I fear that it's often taught in a convergent sort of way. The, uh, we all are familiar with our middle school and high school lessons where topic sentence, topic paragraph, three supporting paragraphs, concluding paragraph. 
I understand the, 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 uh, why that's an important foundation for young people who need to learn how to convey information, but I do fear that it standardizes a creative process, and it sucks a lot of the creativity out of the process, and I actually think it turns a lot of young people off of writing. Um, so uh, and maybe even more importantly, what it does is it conditions us to think linearly. And one great way to get uh, writer's block is to think that you have to write linearly, and you actually don't. Uh, this makes me think of Snoopy. He's always got the first line of his novel down. It was a dark and stormy night. Uh, and by the way, Elmore, the author Elmore Leonard, one of his big rules of writing was never start a book by talking about the weather. <laughs> but oh well. Um, but so he's got, it was a dark and stormy night. He's got that first line. He can never get the second line. Uh, and I say, just, that's okay, skip it, move on, get back to it later. You don't have to go in order. Uh, the great author John Irvin has always said that he writes the last line of his novels first. If you've ever read A Prayer for Owen Meany, which I think is a fantastic book, uh, you know that that long book, it all converges perfectly in the last chapter. I think it's the best ending to any book I've ever read. And, uh, and he wrote, it doesn't matter that he wrote it first. Um, so you can, you can start anywhere you want, you just have to get started. When I write screenplays, I think of them as a collection of scenes that form a narrative arc. But I don't write them in order. I write whatever scene comes to me at whatever time. I may take a three mile walk and during that walk, a scene will form in my head, almost fully formed. And I'll come back and I'll quickly write it. If I waited until it was time to write that scene in order, I would lose the thread, I would, the, the idea would evaporate. So I can go back later and rearrange the scenes, put in transitions, add more scenes, but whatever scene comes to me at the right time, that's what I write. You don't have to go in order. Uh, I've written probably hundreds of magazine articles, and very rarely, if ever, have I written the lead paragraph first. That often comes at the end when I know where I've taken the story. Um, so you can start wherever you want, in the middle, wherever. Sometimes that means putting in placeholders so that you can come back to that later if you want to skip, skip it and come back to it. And a great, I have a great example of that, and it has nothing to do with me. Um, clap if you've, uh, any of you have seen that recent Beatles documentary, Get Back. Has anyone seen that? Okay, good. It was great, right? It could have been a couple hours shorter, but it was great. Um, my favorite part of it was when George Harrison is writing the lyrics to the song Something which I think is one of the most beautiful songs ever written. And he's, he's got, if you know the song, the first line is, something in the way she moves attracts me like no other lover. Well, he's got the first part. He's got something in the way she moves attracts me. And then he turns to his bandmates and he says, attracts me like what? What attracts me? And John Lennon pipes in and he says, just put another word in there until you find the right word. Just say attracts me like a cauliflower. So the first iteration of that iconic, beautiful song was something in the way she moves attracts me like a cauliflower. That's okay, he skipped it, he moved on, he got back to it later, he ended up writing a masterpiece. So you can start wherever you want, even if it's the end. So um, that brings me to the end, a conclusion, which is this. Uh, writing is an art. Don't make it a science. And art requires courage and curiosity. So for all you writers out there, I wish you three things. May your questions be many, may your answers be enlightening, and may you always have the courage to break the rules. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.